This is a video tutorial that outlines not only the reformatted structure of the playing rules, but also the rule of changes that will be in effect starting in the 2022-23 season through to the end of the 23-24 season. Part 1, changes to the playing rules and format. So what did Hockey Canada do? It was in their opinion and the members' opinion that the playing rules were not consistent in structure, had too many repetitive or unclear contradictory elements, and were in general too long and complex overall. This created issues with officials struggling to learn the rules or find specific references, players and team officials that were discouraged in trying to understand the rules due to the complexities, and the playing rules continued to grow in length over time. So what has actually changed within the playing rules? First of all, a full reorganization of each rule with a standard format and consistent wording throughout. Added definitions and terminology at the beginning of each rule prior to getting into the prescribed rule infractions. New rule references like Rule 10.6 Illegal Equipment, which now centrally house a lot of different rule references that were spread out across the rule book and in many cases duplicated in the previous edition. Separate rule references and rule numbers specifically for rules that apply to junior and senior only. Therefore, the example being head contact, Rule 7.7 .7 is called out by a gray box in the rule book, so it's very visually obvious that that rule pertains only to junior and senior, while Rule 7.6 .6 outlines the general application of the head contact rule for minor and female. Same penalty, different interpretations depending on the category of play. Also, there's been a condensing of redundant situations and clarifications to contradictory or ambiguous situations. All of these changes have resulted in 30% less volume of the actual text within the rulebook and a much easier way to navigate and find references. Do note that most of these changes are just format based and not actual changes to the rules and the content is almost the same as what it was in 2001 and 2022's edition. The philosophy behind the playing rules itself. Hockey Canada understands that the playing rules are intended to be a guide to safe and fair hockey from coast to coast to coast, common sense approach of a safe and fair environment. Therefore, the playing rules are simply now split into two primary parts. There are the game fouls, which are rules where penalties are assessed, sections 7 through 11, and part one, the technical rules, where everything else is housed, which is primarily a point of terms of reference, definitions, measurements, and those kinds of guidelines that do not necessarily apply a penalty. With this enhanced consistent structure, navigating the rules will be much easier and more clear. There's a rule number and people will notice that almost all of the game foul rules from section 6 to 11 have a different rule number than there may have been in a previous edition. There will be the rule name, for example, head contact, and general definitions that outline that infraction and any relevant terminology to interpreting the application of that rule. Below that, there will be subcategories and it will note if any of the following penalty types are applicable for that rule. So head contact will have the double minor and minor penalty criteria listed under subcategory A, the criteria for a major penalty under B, and have specific and consistent wording like a major penalty will be assessed based upon the degree of violence of impact, or a major in game misconduct will be assessed anytime a penalty that would otherwise warrant a minor or double minor has been assessed and that action has resulted in an injury and so on so forth through the subcategories. If for example a misconduct is not called under head contact, the subcategory D will note there is no misconduct under this rule. Additionally, the multiple situations that used to be housed under all the rules have been reevaluated, and only those that are relevant have been kept and they're no longer called situations, they're called interpretations. Part 2. Rule changes for 2022 through to 2024. The following rules listed on this slide note every rule where there's been an actual change or addition to the rules that differ from previous editions of the rulebook. Rule 2.2K, players in uniform. A player who is injured can be on the bench during the game, but they must be listed as a player on the game report and they must wear the minimum protective equipment required for their category of play, which includes a CSA certified helmet, a CSA certified facial protector, and a BNQ certified throat protector. This will not apply to any suspended players as they may not be on the bench or listed on the game sheet. 
This is most applicable to players that might be on long-term injury, so not necessarily injured within that game. And if they're wishing to be part of the team and the team wants to make sure they're still included within the team's activities, they can participate on the bench um, as long as they are wearing those pieces of equipment and again that they are listed on the official game report as one of the 19 players that is 17 skaters or two goaltenders or in the case of junior hockey and AAA 18 skaters and two goaltenders for a total of 20 players. Rule 2.4k injured players this really only applies to situations where teams have not had enough players uh, show up to a game where they can dress a goaltender but they at least meet the minimum number of skaters of six skaters that is if during a game where there is no goaltender dressed a team has been awarded a penalty shot a positional player can tend goal during that penalty shot and then return to their position as a skater rule 4.11 penalty shots this is a fairly fundamental change to the application of a penalty shot when a team is awarded a penalty shot now any player on that team can take that penalty shot. Previously it had been the player who was fouled who would be designated to take the shot or a player who was on the ice at the time of the infraction. Now any player on that team that's been awarded the shot can take the shot unless they're otherwise serving a penalty, have been ejected from the game, or are a goaltender. Rule 6.3c, face-off locations. To note, during the 2000 to 2022 rule change cycle, a new rule was added that stated when a penalty is assessed, making a team shorthanded, the faceoff will take place in that offending team's defending zone. Now there are five exceptions to the faceoff being in that location. This rule update clarifies that fifth exception. So to summarize all of the exceptions, the previously existing ones included if the penalty was assessed following the scoring of a goal, at the end of a period or before the start of a period, the faceoff will take place at center ice. If a gathering occurs, the faceoff will take place outside that defending zone. If an icing occurs, therefore the team going on the power play has iced the puck, the faceoff will take place outside the defending zone of the team that iced the puck. And then the new fifth exception, when there's a premature substitution of the goaltender, the faceoff will take place at center ice or anywhere behind center ice as long as it hasn't given the team who committed the premature substitution violation a territorial advantage. Premature substitution of the goaltender is when a goaltender is being removed for the purpose of an extra attacker and the substituting player comes on the ice before the goaltender is within 10 feet. This is not a penalty, but play is stopped. Rule 7.4 charging. There is an update here and an addition. The update is all of the previously existing criteria that could constitute a charge used to be listed in a single sentence and now they've been itemized into a list. At the end of that list, an addition has been made, which is a reference to a blindside hit being also a criteria now for calling a charging penalty. Therefore, the different criteria for charging are listed below, and if any one or more of these exist, a charging penalty would be warranted, unless there is an otherwise more applicable penalty, like checking from behind or head contact. Criteria for charging, charging include a player who jumps to check an opponent, builds up speed taking two or more strides immediately prior to contact, travels an excessive distance with the sole purpose of delivering such a check as described above, or violently and unnecessarily checking an opponent in any manner, and then finally delivering a body check to an opponent's blind side. An opponent's blind side is described as any angle of approach towards a player that is outside their peripheral view, roughly 45 degree angle of vision to the left or to the right of their center point of view. In the following clips, we'll see some examples of a blindside hit that would result in a charging penalty. In this first clip, the player in blue takes a path to their opponent to deliver a check that is outside their opponent's peripheral point of view. Therefore, this is a blindside hit and would be penalized as charging. If the contact is with the head, it would be head contact. In this next clip, the player in white takes an angle approach outside the player's peripheral point of view. Again, a charging penalty or head contact. This final clip is viewable from multiple angles and is arguably late and may meet the criteria of interference. If the principal point of contact is the head, head contact would supersede any other rule. However, it is also from an angle of approach outside the player's peripheral point of view. Therefore, it is a blindside hit and would also qualify under charging. Remember, Puck carriers are responsible for their body orientation, so just because they may have a player in their peripheral view 
and then they turn at the last second causing that hit to come outside of that range does not necessarily mean it's a blindside hit. It is more to protect the player when they do not see the player approaching them at any point prior to contact. Rule 8.7 Clipping Clipping has now been added as its own penalty, which separates it from the reference in tripping previously. Clipping is where any player lowers their body to hit an opponent at or below the knees. Clipping will follow the standard penalty progression of a minor penalty for clipping, a major in game misconduct for clipping based upon the degree of violence of impact, or if an otherwise minor penalty for clipping results in an injury, the major in game will be applied, uh, or a match penalty if it's deemed a deliberate attempt to injure. The clipping signal will be a reverse trip action, and clipping is known basically as a low hit. It's where a player uses their body to make contact at or below an opponent's knees. This may take the form of a player lowering their body prior to making a check, or while being checked, they lower their body in such a manner. Therefore, players may not crouch down to avoid being body checked. Here are some clips of the criteria for clipping. In this first example, the defending player lowers their body, makes contact at or below the opponent's knee. This is a minor penalty for clipping. In this situation, the player lowers their body to the ice with a high degree of violence making contact at or below the knee. This would be a major in game misconduct due to that degree of violence for clipping regardless of injury. In this situation, the puck carrier lowers their body and the ensuing player is contacted at or below the knee. This would be a minor penalty for clipping or a major in game misconduct if injury results. In this situation, a hip check is attempted, but the hip makes contact with the knee. Therefore, this is a major in game misconduct due to the high degree of violence for clipping. In this final clip, the puck carrier lowers their body contacting the opponent below the knee. Due to the high degree of violence of impact with the boards and injury, a major in game would be assessed for clipping. Should a deliberate attempt to injure occur in any clipping action, a match penalty may be assessed. Rule 9.1c butt ending and rule 9.4c spearing have seen the same change to their wording. It's a clarification that a referee may assess a match penalty for butt ending or spearing based upon the degree of violence of force of that action, even if no injury results. Previously, a match penalty could only be assessed when an injury resulted, and now to better follow the criteria of all the other rules, the match penalty will be assessed now based upon the degree of violence of force through the referee's interpretation. It's not a fundamental change, but it's an important clarification that has been made within both of these rules and applies in the same manner. Part three, rule clarifications. The clarifications in this final section of the presentation will outline areas of the rulebook where certain rules have been clarified due to the fact that there were many redundancies or even conflicting information in the previous edition of the rulebook. Therefore, the clarifications are now the true interpretations for these certain situations. Rule 3.6D, Rule 10.6, clarifications regarding not wearing a helmet, facial protector, or neck guard, which is penalized by a minor penalty, as it always has been. And as a reminder, should a player lose their helmet, facial protector, or neck guard during play, they can either replace it properly fastened or go to the bench to be substituted for. However, if they do participate in play, they receive that minor penalty. There are some clarifications here regarding the difference between helmets, facial protectors, and neck guards. In the case of a helmet and facial protector, if the player participates in play without one of those, the play is stopped immediately and the minor penalty is assessed. If the player participates in play while not wearing the neck guard, that is considered a delayed penalty. Also, improperly wearing a helmet, facial protector, or neck guard is a misconduct, which is put on as a delayed penalty. Wearing it improperly could be a helmet in an offset position or perhaps a chin strap that is fastened but not properly secured, a facial protector that is not properly secured, or a neck guard that might be altered, perhaps rolled or taped in a manner where it's not being used in the intended purpose. Rule 3.7, which is a clarification that a referee now has the authority to remove any piece of non-standard equipment from the game that provides an undue advantage to the user in the playing of the game, or that poses a danger to the user or other participants. This would follow the same procedure for any other piece of equipment deemed dangerous. 
Therefore, there used to be a number of different rule references that were very specific to pieces of equipment and why they may be ineligible or dangerous. Now this is more broadly encompassing and all those unique or specific interpretations have been deleted from the rules to reduce the content. Rules 4.8, 4.9, 4.10 have received the clarification that when a participant is removed from the game because of a game ejection, game misconduct, gross misconduct, or match penalty, they do not necessarily have to stay physically in the dressing room as written in the rules, provided that they do not interact with the game or the participants in any manner. So a team official can't try to direct their team or interfere in the game in any way, and same for a player. As long as they don't do that, they are still abiding by the principle of being ejected from that game. Rule 6.2, clarification that all players on the ice must be standing still while a face-off is occurring. This is more of a procedural clarification. Rule 6.2 is a new rule reference that specifically deals with actually conducting a face-off. However, there are no real meaningful changes to the rule other than reiterating this guideline that players must be stationary while a face-off is occurring. Rules 6.9 and 6.10 are clarifications regarding contacting a puck as far as a high stick in relation to a goal. In minor and female hockey, the only criteria for high sticking the puck is the normal height of the shoulders. Therefore, if an attacking player contacts the puck above the normal height of their shoulders and the puck goes in the net, there will be no goal. For junior hockey, the threshold is the height of the crossbar. Therefore, if an attacking player in junior hockey contacts the puck above the normal height of the crossbar, there is no goal. Rule 7.7. .7. This is a new rule reference for head contact specific to junior and senior divisions only. Therefore, there is a rule now 7.6, which is head contact criteria for minor and female, and now there's a separate rule called out in a gray box specific to junior and senior. This rule incorporates all the guidelines that were previously found in the appendix of the Hockey Canada rulebook regarding head contact at these categories, and officials who work junior and senior divisions should review the information to ensure they are accurately applying this rule in accordance to junior and senior. Rules 7.9, 7.10, and 7.11 take the previously existing fighting and roughing rule and split it into three references. So now there's rule 7.9, roughing, which includes roughing after the whistle, rule 7.10, all situations regarding fighting, and Rule 7.11, instigating and aggressing. These are not rule changes per se, but that this rule has been broken down into three different rules now. Rules 8.3, 8.4, and 8.5 take the former rule, interference and protection of the goaltender, and split it into three separate rule references. Rule 8.3, interference, the general criteria for an interference penalty. Rule 8.4, interference from the bench, which as a reminder, have the criteria of a bench minor penalty if a player or a team official is not identified as interfering from the bench, a minor penalty and a game misconduct if you can identify the player that interfered from the bench, and a minor and gross misconduct if you can identify the team official. And then additionally, Rule 8.5, interference with the goaltender, which not only outlines the penalty infractions that would be applied for interfering with the goaltender, but also including language on players in the crease in regards to a goal or no goal situation. Furthermore, with Rule 8.5, there are additional interpretations regarding goaltender interference and the scoring of a goal. First, any goal scored on a play where an attacking player initiates contact with the goaltender will be disallowed, regardless of whether the contact occurs inside or outside the goal crease. The only exception to this is where the attacking player is fouled by a defending player and, as a result, is unable to avoid contact with the goaltender. Two, where an attacking player is tripped, hooked, cross-checked, or otherwise interfered with, falls and makes contact with the goaltender, there must be an effort by the attacking player to avoid making contact with the goaltender. If the player does not make an effort to avoid contact with the goaltender, then they must be penalized for interference with the goaltender. The referee should also penalize the defending player who committed the initial foul under the appropriate rule. Three, an attacking player is not committing a foul by simply standing in the goal crease. However, if while standing in the crease, the attacking player attempts to play the puck, interfere with the play, or impede the goaltender's vision or movements, then no goal may be scored. If the puck enters the net in this situation, the goal must be disallowed. Note, no penalty would be assessed unless the attacking player's body or stick makes actual physical contact with the goaltender. And finally, four, an attacking player is standing in the goal crease. The puck is shot, hitting the player in the crease, and drops down in the crease. The attacking player goes out of the crease, then shoots the puck into the goal, 
This is a goal. The puck did not enter the goal while the attacking player was actually in the crease. Rule 10.3, additional language and definitions have been added surrounding diving and embellishment, both of which should be penalized with an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. While these are not necessarily rule changes, these clarifications better define those actions. For example, diving is more of a description of a situation where no foul has been committed and a player attempts to draw a penalty where there is no foul and they receive the only minor penalty and it is for unsportsmanlike conduct. Embellishment is more of a situation where there is a foul and the player who is fouled attempts to exaggerate that foul to draw a penalty and both players would often receive penalties. Therefore, you may have a tripping penalty and an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty due to the embellishment.